guys, welcome back. Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN and mom to four. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We are so happy to have you. If you're not new, you know how this goes. Today we're watching a TV show and I'm running it with educational commentary. You guys recommended season one, episode six of Chicago Med. If you have other recommendations for movies or TV shows that have an OB or GYN theme in them, let me know in the comments down below. He's having a seizure. Does he have epilepsy? No. Any history of seizures? No. With your permission, I'd like to run some tests and see what's going on. Of course. I got Parker's test results back. It shows excessive demyelination. Explains the clumsiness. I don't want to jump to conclusions, but I'm pretty sure he has Crabby a disease. Yeah, he's eight, so it's late onset. I don't know a ton about crab eye disease. It is very rare and it's genetic. It's passed in families. That means there's about a 25% chance that each of their children will have the illness. They have to get a single copy from mom and a single copy from dad. And if you remember back to your genetics classes, there's a 25% chance they don't carry it. There's a 50% chance they're a carrier, but not effective. And there's a 25% chance that they are affected by the disease because it's autosomal recessive. And I've now told you literally everything I know about it. How are you feeling? Wonderful. You know, considering the fact that I can't sleep longer than 15 minutes. And when I do actually get comfortable, I have to pee. Fun. Insomnia in the third trimester is very, very common. Most people who are pregnant will experience insomnia at some point during their last trimester of pregnancy, and it's even more common than outside of pregnancy in every trimester. One of the most common questions I get about sleeping in the third trimester is if it's okay to sleep on your back or if it's true that that can be dangerous. This is way easier to explain with a prop, so I'm gonna go find my little animal and let you hear about the sponsor while I'm gone. This video is sponsored by Native, an aluminum-free deodorant that actually works. No, seriously, I made them let me use it for several weeks because I wanted to make sure that I truly loved it as I've had some bad experiences with skin irritation and bad smells in the past using non-conventional deodorants. Native isn't sticky, it dries quickly, and perhaps most importantly and most impressively, it lasts all day, even on long call shifts, wearing very non-breathable personal protective equipment. Because I know some people are really sensitive to fragrances, I always look to see if these brands offer an unscented version and Native does, which I think is super cool. Fragrances don't really bother me, I kinda like them, so I chose the Cucumber Mint, coconut vanilla, and lavender rose. I like all of them, they all smell really good. I think the cucumber mint is my favorite. It's light and refreshing without being overpowering. The deodorants don't have any parabens or sulfates and they are vegan and cruelty free. They come with a starter pack that includes three deodorants. You can pick all the fragrances and if you wanna try them out and support my channel in the process, use my link in the description to get 33% off your first order with free shipping to most places. Now let's get back to the video. It is true that when you have a baby all rolled up inside and baby is pushing down towards mom's back, that those large vessels in mom's back can become compressed and decrease blood flow both to her vital organs and to the placenta and thus to the baby with prolonged periods of laying in that position. You're going to feel bad because of decreased blood flow to your vital organs before it causes major problems to baby. So yeah, ideal sleeping position would be on your left or right side, but if you wake up on your back in the middle of the night, it shouldn't be a cause for panic. That's just your body saying, hey, you've been laying on your back a little while, I'm not feeling great, will you roll over? Try to go to sleep laying on your side. If you wake up on your back, just change your position. Gives him five to seven years before he becomes confined to a bed and completely vegetative. Dr. Manning? You okay? No. I think my water just broke. Oh my God, it did. I guess this is happening today. Uh... Usually the fluid is clear or maybe clear with some white vernix stuff in it, which is the coating on the baby's skin while they're inside. That was dark looking fluid and it looked like what we would call meconium, but it also could be blood that's in it. So I'm not sure if that's going to just end up being nothing and that's just the way they made the fluid look or if it's going to end up being meconium fluid, which is when the baby has a bowel movement prior to delivery, or if it's going to end up being blood in the fluid. How much longer do we have to do this? 10 more laps. Make sure everything gets in line correctly down there. 
You know, I am seriously regretting making you my birthing coach. <laughs> Good. That means I'm doing my job. Like she has a doula or maybe just a friend who's going to be her birthing partner and has a little bit of education in this. Doulas have been associated with better subjective birth experiences for mothers and also for improving birth outcomes. Excellent addition to the labor and delivery team. What is a doula? A doula is someone who is not trained medically. So they aren't nurses or doctors or midwives or anything like that. The doulas have special training in being a labor support person or a pregnancy support person. So their job is to support the person who's having a baby. There's a lot of different ways that doulas provide support but they are unique in that they don't have medical training. They have excellent training in birth support and birth coaching. I have to tell the parents that their eight-year-old child is going to die and that the same thing might happen to their three-year-old. So I guess I was just wondering, how do, how do I do that? In my experience, it's best to be direct and get straight to the point. They might seem like they have a million questions. They might want to be left alone. The most important thing is that they need to know that somebody's there who understands what they're going through. Really, it's your compassion that they need to feel. Compassion. Yeah. Breaking bad news to patients is something that we get training on in medical school, but something that, in my opinion, a lot of people don't do well. It's hard and it's not enjoyable. People assume that in OBGYN, we are a happy field and we don't do much breaking bad news, but in reality, this field is about 90% happy, but the 10% that's not is just gut-wrenching terrible. I unfortunately am in a position to break terrible news to people more often than I would like, whether that's telling someone that they have cancer or their baby is really sick, making diagnosis of malformations on ultrasound or sharing about a miscarriage or babies who don't have a heartbeat and will be stillborn. I agree with some of his points. You have to be direct. You can't beat around the bush. You have to be sensitive to what someone needs. Don't break bad news and get up and walk away. It's really hard to watch someone go through something and just sit silently with them. What I disagree with is him saying that they want to know that someone is there who understands. Patients don't want you to pretend you understand. And unless you have actually walked that road, in this case of having a child with a terminal illness, then you don't understand and it's offensive to pretend you understand. Much better, I would think, to say something like, I have no idea how this feels, but I want you to know I'm here. Do you want me to stay with you? Would you like me to leave? Would you like a minute? Do you want me to call someone for you? And sometimes they will say, I don't know. And that is when you say, I'm just gonna sit here and hold your hand then. That's okay, you don't have to know. a normal reaction, leaving and debriefing with your team or breaking down like this is completely normal. I wish that she would have talked to her friend or attending about it rather than going at it alone, but I do like that they're showing that it's normal and okay to have this overwhelming sense of grief and sadness for what your patients are going through after you've given them that kind of news. There was meconium in your water, so we'll want to watch for fetal aspiration during delivery. Okay. Oof. Your dilation is four centimeters. So, looks like you're on your way. So they did circle back with the fluid and I'm glad that they called that meconium and not normal fluid. Meconium is when the baby has a bowel movement prior to delivery. Probably about 15% of full-term deliveries will have meconium. It's less common in premature babies and more common when you get past your due date. Out of those 15%, only about 2% will end up having what she's referencing, which is meconium aspiration, which is where the baby takes a big deep breath uh, and gets some of that into the lungs after delivery. This is not always a terrible diagnosis. We want to be cautious at delivery and have the pediatrics team nearby so that they can suction the baby if needed and get some of that out if they do take a deep breath of it. We also want to be realistic that the diagnosis of meconium fluid is pretty common and major complications from that are pretty rare. Your BP is rising. 
still okay, right? The baby's not descending. I'm worried he's occiput posterior and stuck in the birth canal. What does that mean? The baby is sunny side up. Breathe. We need to consider a C-section. C-section? Is it that serious? Is the baby in danger? Ma'am, I'm sorry, but I think it would be better if you waited outside. No, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I don't really like the way anyone in this room is treating each other right now. She said the baby is occiput posterior, facing the ceiling instead of the floor. We would like babies to come out this way, but he's trying to come out this way. Sunny side up or occiput posterior does not always mean you need a C-section. A lot of babies can be born sunny side up and a lot of times they will turn in the process of pushing or you can help them turn during the process of pushing. We're not there yet. Are you questioning my judgment? I'm her midwife and I don't think cutting it to her is a good idea yet. Are you going to listen to her or your obstetrician? <laughs> not? I can turn the baby. Let her try. <laughs> no one in that room is acting right. You don't talk to anyone else who's a member of the birth team like that. Not the mother-in-law and not the support person. A midwife is a specially trained medical provider and it's different from a birth coach. So maybe she is a midwife. I don't know why she's not delivering the baby if she's the patient's midwife. That doesn't make sense. So the dynamics here are a little unusual. I'm kind of with the midwife slash doula slash birth support person here that someone should try to turn the baby if they can do it. Oh, and a thought just came to my head. I don't understand why the OBGYN doesn't turn the baby. It's not a procedure that only midwives can do. I do this all the time. It's called manual rotation. <laughs> understand what's happening. What they're depicting right now is if you were doing an external cephalic version for a baby that was breech and you were trying to turn it to be head down. Hey, I'm editing and I just realized I really wasn't super clear on how it was so easy to tell that they were doing the wrong procedure. So external cephalic version is done with two hands on the abdomen. Manual rotation is done with one hand vaginally on baby's head, turning the baby over. Does that make sense? So what I'm describing now is a manual rotation where you're turning the baby's head with a vaginal hand and not two hands on the abdomen, which would be an external rotation. If you're trying to turn a baby that is already head down but is facing this way, you do that with what we call manual rotation and we do that with a three point turn. So you're feeling for essentially the soft spot. You guys all know the soft spot on the baby's head. They're connected by a suture line that's called the sagittal suture, which is the skull bones where they come together. They're not fused all the way and you can feel that to decide which position the baby is in. You do all of that by feel. So if I have a baby that's positioned like this, I use my dominant hand to put three fingers gently on the baby's head and you're going to push up just a little bit and see if you can rotate the baby. Sometimes they turn easily, sometimes they won't turn at all. Baby's still OP, we should operate. Not yet. One more time, okay, now? smile when it worked even though she really didn't want that midwife birth coach doula person to try it is really how we all feel we root for our patients to have vaginal deliveries as much as anyone else a c-section in a baby that's that low is not just a quick and easy thing it can be a difficult surgery i just like that they depicted her smiling and being happy about it because that would be real life okay i'm so tired listen to me okay you can do this. Three, two, one. Okay, that's it. Here he is. We've got a tight nuchal cord. Tight nuchal cord is umbilical cord around the neck. That is a very, very common thing we see. I would say, I don't know, one in five deliveries I do will have the umbilical cord around the neck. Rarely causes problems. What's happening? Baby's not breathing. Oh. Clamp, clamp. What's happening? Okay, now. Cut. Tell me what's happening! Here you go. Someone tell me what's happening! The way that they manage that whole situation with mom screaming, tell me what's happening, and everybody saying, baby's not breathing, or just ignoring her is really not okay and not how I think most of us would handle that. I would have said, you know, baby is just taking a little while to acclimate. We're gonna stimulate. We're gonna see if we can get him crying. We're gonna put him over on the warmer or on your belly to see if somebody can, you know, suction him out and get him to perk up. Oh, 
baby has really pretty eyes, very alert. Took him a few minutes to perk up, but overall that's a pretty normal reaction for a baby that's been through a little bit of a rough entry into the world. If that happened at a delivery, I hope the team would handle it a little bit better with as far as like communication with the mother. I'm gonna name him Owen. It's Irish for little fighter. Really good episode, excellent learning point. If you didn't catch my video with Dr. Mike on Monday, check that out. Next Monday is gonna be a video on PCOS. Subscribe if you don't want to miss that. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.